Tom, thank you for coming back. Pleasure, Dan, as ever. I, I mean, I'm not alone. I was not alone in thinking you were a bit eccentric. Tom Holland, the genius writer, the man who's be be beguiled millions of readers over the world, desperate they all were for you to finish your massive task of your lifetime, which is writing the great history of the Roman Empire in the West. And yet you took all this time out to write this kind of crazy book about Christianity. I was not alone in thinking you were crazy, and I was completely wrong, because it's, an, it's a work of genius. But why, so what, why did you want to write this, and what did you want to say in it? Well, it's, uh, as you'll know, um, people will often say that um, it's, it's works of fiction, it's, it's novels that are personal. But you'll know that, that works of non-fiction as well often draw deep on the wellsprings of childhood obsessions or uh, youthful passions. Um, and that's absolutely the case with my uh, interest in ancient history. Um, it, it was a kind of seamless evolution from my fascination with dinosaurs, big, fierce, glamorous, extinct, and then I moved seamlessly on to ancient empires. And I always identified with um, the strong men of, of, of Greece and Rome, uh, and I always regarded um, the biblical stories as, as, as being a bit boring, to be honest, in comparison. Not in themselves. I mean, I loved all the accounts of the Assyrians and the, uh, the Egyptians and the Babylonians, but the children of Israel themselves didn't really measure up compared to these great empires. Um, and in the New Testament, to be honest, I, I was absolutely on the side of Pontius Pilate <laughs> as opposed to Jesus. So um, as a result of that, my sense of identification when I came to, to, to initially to write um, history was, was very much with these kind of uber predators, these tyrannosaurs of, of the ancient world. But the process of writing about Caesar, about uh, Leonidas, trying to get inside the minds of the Romans, of, of the Spartans, of the Assyrians, I began to find them um, increasingly alien and, and not a little bit frightening, frightening. And to be honest, it was the kind of the innocent quality of their callousness that unsettled me. Um, and so inevitably I began to wonder, well, what happened? What, what explains the, the, the kind of evolution of thought that means that now, rather than praising the Spartans for chucking babies who may not measure up to their, their standards of citizenship down a ravine, we're now appalled by that. Why now do we go to such efforts to keep um, young children when they're born, maybe on, on life support? You know, what, what, what explains this vast process of change? I mean, that's just one example. But in almost every way, the, the, the resemblance between, say, the Roman world and ours, they are faux ami. They, they may seem to be similar, but in, in, the more you look at them, the more you realise how, how different they are, how, how, how alien, how strange. And that's even on the most fundamental level, so things like sexuality, things like that. So over the process of the past few years, um, I, I've been recalibrating exactly where it is that I morally, ethically, culturally come from, and essentially where the whole of, of Western society comes from. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion, rather like someone looking, you know, can't quite identify an itch on the back, and then you find it, and it's really great when you scratch it. I've come to the conclusion that essentially, I, I am Christian. I am not a, a classically Greek or Roman. I, I am essentially Christian and I think that you are, even though you might deny that. I think the whole of the society, Western society that we've grown up is. And I think essentially we are all goldfish and the water in which we are swimming is Christian. Which is not to say that we all are confessional Christians. We may not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ rose on the third day. But if we think of, of Christianity as a kind of civilization, a matrix, a, a way of seeing and understanding the world, and one above all that has grounded kind of revolutionary concepts like, uh, like progress, reformatio, revolution at its heart, then we can see how the very fact that the past 2000 years of Western history have been so unstable, the fact that um, it has changed so much, is also tribute to the fact about something that hasn't changed, which is that the, the impulses and the wellsprings of this process derive from the one source, which I think is 
is Christianity. So that essentially is the argument of the book. And so for someone who has spent most of his time writing about antiquity, it's an incredibly exciting project. Firstly, because you are actually tracing the influence of something that derives from antiquity right the way through time, right the way up to the present. And also because it enabled me to write about periods of history that I've always been fascinated by, but haven't until now had, had, had the opportunity to write about. So I've written about uh, you know, medieval century. history. Yes, absolutely. You lucky Early thing. modern history, 18th century, right the way up into the 20th century. And um, it's, as it happens, enabled me to write about all kinds of things, again, that, 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 that interested me from childhood, from dinosaurs. Dinosaurs feature prominently you know, in the chapter on, 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 on science. Um, Beatles, whatever, it's, it's all there. So it's, it's a, a, although um, a, a book that I hope is objective, that I hope um, uh, is, is fair, nevertheless, it is also a deeply personal book. And, and it's personal because I think that writing about this subject, whether you do it from a position of faith, of atheism, of agnosticism, nevertheless, this subject is personal to you because you have been shaped by it. Um, wh why? Can you explain to me how revolutionary Christianity was in its early form. Well, I I think that um, Paul, who is our the, the earliest um, Christian sources, the letters written within a, a, a couple of decades of the crucifixion, he he places at the heart of his message the idea that. Um, the Messiah has come, that he didn't come in martial glory to liberate the people of Israel from, uh, from the Romans, but he was nailed to a cross and suffered death as, as, as a slave. Um, and yet this humiliating death has been experienced by Paul and by others like him as in a blinding flash of revelation that this is the beginning of, of a new covenant. And Paul says that this, this understanding of the crucifixion of a slave, you know, the, the, the worst imaginable death, the most humiliating death, that in some way this has totally set the world on, an, on a new axis, that this is um, a, a stumbling block to the Jews and it is folly to everyone else. And it's a stumbling block to the Jews because, of course, the idea that the, 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 the Messiah had basically being a failure is shocking. And yet Paul says that he's, he's drawing this conclusion from clearly from his understanding of the Jewish scriptures, from the way in which actually going through the Jewish scriptures, the all-powerful God, the creator of heaven and earth, seems to have identified with, with losers, with those at the bottom of the heap, with those who get kicked around, with those who have sand kicked in their face by the, the local bullies. Um, but it's also a stumbling block to the Jews, of course, because in some mysterious way, which Paul and all his recipients again seem to accept and Paul is kind of groping after a way to explain it. The, this, 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 this slave who was nailed to a cross in some mysterious way was a part of the one creator God. And so that therefore implies that there is a kind of a potency in suffering, in defeat, in being the lowest of the low that is incredibly subversive of just about everything that people in the first century AD take for granted. On top of that, Paul is saying that this new covenant supersedes the covenant that um, had existed between the children of Israel and God. That now this covenant is for everybody across the face of the earth. Um, there is no Greek or Jew, Paul says. There is no man or woman. There is no slave or free. And he founds this sense, this, this sublime sense of human dignity on the notion that all human beings are created in the image of God. And now God has sacrificed himself so that all may be freed, all may be share in the liberation that Paul is preaching. And so that gives both a, a sense of dignity to the lowest of the low, but it also provides a universal context for that. It, it, it proclaims that the ideal is not, as, as the Jews had hitherto thought, in a kind of exclusiveness, but in a universalism. So these are radical ideas. 
um, that the weak have a peculiar dignity, that all human beings are created equally in the image of God. And these are subversive of the way that Jews have thought of, of their relationship to God, but of course transplanted to the, 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 the Greco-Roman world, it is equally subversive. And it's particularly subversive in the way that it, 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 it shrines the idea that defeat can be a form of victory. And so these then reverberate through the, the decades, the centuries and the millennia that follow. And the Christian church emerges like a kind of cuckoo in the imperial nest because the emphasis on caring for those who are weak, those who are at the bottom of the pile, expresses itself through a radical new doctrine of, of, of charity, of giving you know, the rich give to the poor to store up treasure for themselves in heaven. This is not designed as systems were in, in, in Greek cities or in Rome as forms of patronage. This is a, a, a giving that is done because God wants it and because the, the weak, the poor, the orphans, the widows, uh, the old people, these have a, have a, have a, have a dignity. Um, and so when Constantine becomes emperor, uh, when Constantine, um, the, the, the emperor, becomes a Christian, this kind of welfare state that exists within the, the Roman Empire is then given an imperial dignity as well. Um, and this then enables, when the Roman Empire in the West crumbles away, the church endures and survives. And when Gibbon argues that um, Christianity sapped the will of the Romans, that it kind of corroded the foundations of the Roman state, he gets it exactly wrong. It, it, it is Christianity that enables what remains of Roman culture to survive into, into the future, but of course transformed and transmuted. And in a sense, the, 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 the primal revolution consists of the way in which Paul and people like him, people proclaiming that this slave nailed to a cross is in some way um, coterminous with, 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 with the one creator. This is the, the kind of the primal revolution. This is the, the primal earth shock. But further reverberations continue to ripple through history. And particularly the form that Christianity takes in the Latin West, where there is no emperor as there is in Constantinople. Um, and so what happens in the, in the Latin West in the early Middle Ages is that the church accrues a kind of growing sense of its own dignity. It, it, it emancipates itself from the idea that it is dependent on emperors or more specifically on a particular empire. So that when in, in 410 uh, Rome is sacked and people who um, lament the passing of the old ways say that because we have abandoned the old gods, therefore the gods have abandoned Rome. Probably the most influential of the Latin fathers, Augustine, um, says, no, uh, we have the city of man and that is ephemeral. It's bubbles on the, the flow of time. And he gives a word to this, cyculum. And the Latin word cyculum means the limit of, of living memory. So the flux, everything comes and it goes and it changes. And all of Roman power is, is, is are merely winking bubbles on the flow of the cyculum. And he opposes to that the city of God, which is eternal and unchanging. And the only way that human beings can resist the flow of the cyculum is to secure a firm binding, as bind themselves as closely as they can to this vision of, of, of unchanging eternity. And a binding in Latin is a religio. And it might be a sacrifice, it might be a festival, it might be a priesthood. But in the Christian world where there can be only one religio, religio comes to be it, it, it comes to describe the process by which someone who, has, who, who particularly wants to consecrate him or herself to God, um, maybe as a monk, maybe as a nun, maybe as a hermit, that's what religio is. And so religio comes to be counterpointed to the flux of the cyculum. And in the 11th century, this is weaponized by radicals who in an earlier generation would have been described as heretics. And 
they want to apply the notion of reformatio, of remaking yourself, that is kind of fundamental to the Christian idea of the self, the idea that you can baptize, be baptised, that your sins can be washed away, that you can be born again, you can be cleansed anew, that you can be illuminated by the light of, of, of proper understanding, by the light of the Spirit. And they want to apply this to the dimension of the entire world. And to do this, they draw on the ideas of the cyclum and of, of, of a church that should be properly consecrated to God. And so they want to wash off the grubby finger marks of kings and emperors who have been pouring at, at, at the, 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 the sacral purity of the church as they see it. And so through a convulsive process, they separate the church from the fabric of the state as the various kingdoms and, and, and imperial entities that exist throughout the, the, the Latin West. And they do this by humbling kings. So Henry IV, the emperor, is, is, is humiliatingly reduced to waiting outside the Pope's castle. Um, they inspire ideologically motivated warriors to travel to the ends of the earth in the cause of, of, of consecrating the earth to this vision of, of purity and liberty. Those are the Crusades. They mandate lawyers to fashion entire frameworks of international law that can in a sense consecrate the church as the first modern state, a state that, that, that lays claim to its own sovereignty, that enshrines the, 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 the legal system of the church as the ultimate uh, source of recall for people across everywhere in Christendom and the Pope himself at the head of it. And the people who structure these are, are, are the canonists, the canon lawyers, who fairly soon are inscribing as, as a right of the poor. The, up until then, it's been thought that the rich have, have a duty to give to the poor. But these canon lawyers start to inscribe in, in the frameworks of law that are applied across Christendom that the poor and the weak have a right. And so we're getting the birth of some very radical notions there as well. So the Middle Ages... Far from being a kind of ossified um, uh, frozen period of time, is are absolutely the opposite. This is a convulsive process of revolution, and it establishes a, 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 a kind of archetype of reformatio, of reformation, of revolution that will repeat over and over again throughout European history from then on, because of course. At the heart of Christianity is the principle that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. But the problem with that is that every revolution throws up new elites. And in time, those elites become oppressive. They become hegemonic. They become rich. They become self-satisfied. And that in turn prompts within the breasts of Christians the yearning for a fresh reformatio. And so what we call the reformation is merely the second experience of reformatio that Europe's had. And again, we see this idea of kings being humbled, of, um, of ideologically motivated warriors going to the ends of the world, of people, uh, entire orders of um, subversive revolutionaries laying claim to the notion that they have been enlightened, that they have obtained a form of enlightenment. And again, you can see again that this will replicate itself with the French Revolution, with the Russian Revolution into the 60s. And so in a sense, we absolutely remain the heirs of that process. And we take it so for granted that we don't see how culturally contingent it is. That's an inordinately long answer to your question. That was but a... that, in essence, is what is revolutionary about Christianity, is that it shrines at the heart of the civilization of what becomes the West, the idea that there can be progress and that there should be change. My, I guess my... my obviously, that's incredibly compelling. I guess my only thought is how much... How much comparative history do you have to do? You have to look at J Japan, South Asia, Central American civilizations, to, or, or, or do you not need to sort of look at it in terms of a kind of a, la a laboratory testing of, of these of these ideas? Well, I think I think you have to um, uh, you have to test, for instance, the proposition that um, a notion of the cyclum, a notion of what will become the secular, is distinctive to. Uh, to Western Christendom. 
and and that clearly seems to me the the case and one of the what the things that that complicates this is that um we speak european languages and european languages are saturated in christian assumptions and we over the course of our history have then taken these languages and implanted them in other reaches of the world um, so in india for instance you will get people who speak english you know better than i do um, but in speaking english they are using words that are freighted with christian assumptions and so secular would absolutely be one of them by the time the british are going to india uh, they are doing so as protestants who have developed a very different sense of what secular means to what it had meant in the heyday of the Middle Ages, still more in the, the age of, of, of Augustine, because with the, with the Reformation, the notion of, um, of, of religio as being something distinctive to monks or nuns, it's been democratized. Everyone now has a religio, so a sense of a kind of personal bond with the divine. But at the same time, religion, the anglicization of this Latin word religio, also means something that is distinct from what's coming to be called the secular. So you can say, you know, what is, what, what, what is the religion in England? What should it be? This is the great issue that the civil war is fought over. Uh, what is religion in France? What is religion in the land of the Turks? And what is the religion in Hindustan, in the land of the Hindus, in the land of the Indians? And the British go there and say, what is the religion? And it's, a, it's an insane question because they don't have a religion. I mean, religion would have meant nothing to a, 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 a Christian in the Middle Ages, still less to, to a Hindu, an Indian, because it's simply not a conceptualization that they have. But the, the British are able to kind of, rather like Procrustes, the, um, the, uh, the robber in the, the legend of Theseus. Cannibal. Yes, who, who, who has a magical bed and he either stretches people or he lops limbs off to make them fit this magical bed. That's basically what the British do. They go there and they see that, you know, the Hindus have, uh, they have uh, temples and they have what appear to be priests and they have what appear to be scriptures. And so they construct something, a religion of the Hindus, which they start by the, the turn of the, the 18th, 19th century to call Hinduism. And they say, well, this is the religion of the Hindus. Um, and, there, and, and, and then they say, well, there is this secular space and there's the religion of the Hindus, the religion of, the, of, of, of Islam, there's all the various religion of the Buddhists, whatever. And they construct these images of, that are patterned on Christianity. And so, although the British do not convert India to Christianity in the way that, say, the Spanish convert the Mexicans to Christianity. Nevertheless, when, when, when the Raj ends, when India becomes independent, it becomes independent as a secular state that's written into the constitution. And this reflects a kind of assumption that the, the Indian elite, all of whom have been educated in British schools and who reflect the stamp of kind of the, the English language and, and, and the freight of assumptions that it carries, that the secular is an unproblematic term, that, that, that everyone's had, had this notion of the secular, but they haven't. And this is increasingly being pointed out by Indian scholars. So one of them, who I quote in the book, says that the process of Christianization happens in two ways. It happens through conversion and it happens through secularization. And he's absolutely right. And in a sense, what's happening um, in India at the moment with um, Modi and, and the rise of what we would you know, in, the, in the West call Hindu nationalism. Actually, I, I, it, it, it's a reaction and it, it may be inchoate rather than, than reasoned, but it's a reaction against the sense that actually the notion of the secular, the notion of something called Hinduism being a religion is an, an alien import. It is an alien way of seeing the world. Um, and yet we, because we're so sad, because we are the goldfish in swimming in this, you know, in this water, we don't see it. We don't recognize the, that we're in water. We don't recognize we're in a bowl. And the ambition of the book is to kind of try and open the eyes of, of people, of readers to the fact, yeah, we are in a bowl. And this bowl has a very distinctive contour and shape. So let's talk about this goldfish here, Dan in his bowl. Okay, so I'm somebody, as you know, who does not believe 
that the world was created in seven days by God. I don't believe, I don't go to church. I don't believe in the, uh, I'm not a pr- practicing uh, believer. I am an atheist. And yet you are, you are telling me that but atheism you, you would itself... you call yourself a humanist. Humanist. You, you would define yourself as a humanist. Yeah, so you okay. are saying that so, that so is So the a... foundation of, your, of, of humanism is a quite a strange one. It's, it's, it's the notion that humans have a distinct status, that they are somehow special. Um, where does this conviction come from this idea that that, that that humanity somehow has a kind of universal dignity well it, you know, it doesn't come from the Greeks it doesn't come from the Romans it it comes from essentially from Genesis the very book that you've just poo-pooed because in Genesis it says that God creates man and woman in his own image and so for Jews and Christians man and woman has an inherent dignity that is much greater than that, really, of, it, of any other civilization. It's a kind of universal dignity. And humanism is a, essentially an attempt to abstract this notion from the, 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 the kind of the matrix of Christianity and to allow it to kind of live without the, 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 the cultural framework that had originally given it well, its uh, life force. Yes, but all the spiritual framework. Yeah, the spiritual frame. But isn't that okay? I mean, isn't it okay? It's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. But, 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 but it, is a, it is a faith position, and it is no less a faith position than that of a Protestant or, or a Catholic. And it is recognisably bred of the marrow of Christian civilization. and you would not be a humanist had it, were it not for the fact that you in live in a, in a society shaped by Christian assumptions. And in a way... Much of, of, of intellectual culture in the West over the past 150 years has been an attempt by um, various people who, who no longer believe in the Christian God to find a justification for the beliefs that derive from Christianity. So it may be, you know, a, 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 by saying I'm a humanist, it may be by, by saying I'm a Marxist, and Marx's, Marx's great pretense is that his indignation at the sufferings of the poor at the hands of the rich, his conviction that there will be a, a, a day of judgment when uh, the poor will inherit the earth and the rich will be cast down. His, his, his conceit is that he has derived all this from the, the purely objective number crunching that he's been doing in the reading room at the British Library. But it's evident when you read Marx that his indignation at the suffering of those who are evicted by rapacious landlords, uh, children who go blind from working in factories late into the night, um, people in far off colonies oppressed so that the bourgeoisie can have sugar for their tea. This is animated by something that goes way beyond his number crunching. This is animated by a deep moral conviction that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And Marx, by virtue of his descent from a line of Jews who convert to Lutheranism is clearly drawing on the moral inheritance of both Jewish and Christian teachings. And yet, if you become a Marxist, you can buy into these this inheritance of teachings without actually having to, to buy into Christian belief. Similarly, the construction in 19th century of a concept called science, which, you know, a sci- science is been sciences simply means a kind of a, 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 a framework of knowledge. People have been studying sciences in, in universities, Christian institutions, of course, um, since, 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 since the high Middle Ages. But the notion that there is something called science, this is a kind of uh, a conceptualization of, of, of the mid 19th century. And so you say, well, what is science? People now tend to assume that science, again, a bit like the secular, is just something that's always existed. It's always been there. You have debates about did the Greek, you know, what was the contribution of the Greeks to science? What was the comp- com- contribution of, of the Muslim caliphate to science? But it's, but, but it's hopelessly anachronistic. Science is constructed at a time when the notion of religion, you know, religion has, 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 as a category, has essentially evolved over the preceding centuries. Science is constructed as its doppelganger. Science is constructed to be what religion is not. And yet, as is the way with doppelgangers, it bears the stamp of what it's rejecting. So what you will find with people who who are not just, not the people who are doing what we might call science, but people who are promoting science as 
a solution to the superstition that is supposedly embodied in something called religion. People who, who write in that kind of way, what they're doing is saying, um, science enables us to banish superstition. It enables us to bring the people who had walked in darkness into a great light. It enables us to understand the way that we should live our lives properly. And those who promote and propagate this perspective cast themselves as moral arbiters. They, they, they have no hesitation in saying what is right and wrong. And in doing that, of course, they are betraying their origins in Protestant assumptions about Catholicism. The whole narrative that is constructive in the 19th century, that there's been a kind of age old war between something called religion and something called science. This is simply an expression of the kind of the age of the, the traditional Protestant animus against Catholicism, except that it's now including Protestantism itself within, <laughs> within its targets. But someone like Richard Dawkins is, is an infinite, you know, I mean, is an incredibly Christian figure. He's, he's draw, he's, the, the morality that he's preaching clearly draws from, from the inheritance of, of, of the English Protestantism that has, in, in which he was born. It's just that he's now including Christianity as something that he's condemning, and he's replaced it with something called science. But at, at its core, humanists, Marxists, um, those who think that science teaches us liberal values, all that they are doing is grabbling around for some way, some prop, some way in which they can justify clinging on to Christian morality without Christian belief. Uh, but isn't that scrabbling around necessary if you decide that you quite like Christian morality? You think that, yeah. that Jesus and Paul were extraordinary and transformative uh, uh, philosophers, thinkers, but you don't believe that Jesus was a deity. Of course. Of course, if you lose your faith, then you have to find some other way of, uh, but you want to keep hold of the, the, the package, then you have to, to find some other way. But the problem is that, um, a, a, as we know from the history of the 20th century, that actually, if you uh, get rid of Christian belief, then it becomes quite easy to, um, to get rid of the, uh, the Christian values as well. And of course, the, um, the philosopher who famously points this out is Nietzsche. Um, and... Nietzsche's most famous parable is, 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 is of the killing of God. And the person who proclaims that, that, that God is dead and that we have killed him, we, humanity, have killed him, at, at first is ignored. People don't believe him. Because although God is dead, his corpse lies in the cave, its shadows still seem to move. And so Nietzsche says that after a crime of such a scale, people will continue to believe that God is dead for many for, that God is alive for many centuries, even though in fact he, you know, it's, it, it, it's corpse, it's cold, it's gone forever. Um, and the object of this parable isn't so much believing Christians, people who continue to go to church and to, to, to believe that God exists and that Christ rose on the third day. Rather, it's the people that I've just been talking about. It's the humanists, it's the liberals, it's the socialists, it's the communists, it's the philosophers. It's people who, who imagine that they can cling on to Christian morality without Christian belief. And Nietzsche says that, you know, this will go because a new order will arise and great process of convulsion, supermen will arise who will no longer need to be bound by this morality of, of a murdered God. And this, of course, was hugely influential in the wake of the First World War, first on Mussolini and then on, on, uh, on the Nazis. And Himmler says, just as Dawkins or a Marxist or anyone might say, that, that there's nothing special about humans. You know, we're all just organisms. There's nothing special about humans. We're just animals like any other animal. And therefore, People who promote the idea that humans have any, spe you know, there's anything special about humans are, are, are deluded. And that then provides the basis for the ideological justification for what he and the Nazis generally set out to do. And they set out very, very consciously to trample down two of the, the, the core Christian 
teachings. One, that all human beings, you know, humanism essentially, that all human beings are, 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 are created equal and have an equal dignity. And secondly, that the weak have a special status, a special hold, that the strong have a responsibility to the weak, that the powerful have a responsibility to the powerless. These are the, the two fundamental Christian teachings that the Nazis set themselves to repudiate with genocidal effect. And in the wake of, 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 of the Second World War, in the wake of the Holocaust, in the wake of the um, elimination of those who are condemned by the Nazis as mentally or physically defective, in the wake of the, the, the murder of an entire races of people because they are assumed to be subhuman. In post-war, in the post-war West, the experience of this is felt as such a shock, as such a blasphemy, that it imprints the Christian ideals that have been offended by the Nazis as ideals to be upheld that can be believed in without necessarily believing in, in, in the religion that had given them birth. And so rather than the devil, Hitler gets enshrined as the embodiment of purest evil. Uh, rather than believe in hell, we have the image of, of Auschwitz. And We no longer need to articulate evil in an overtly Christian way because we have evil with flags and swastikas and black uniforms and louse ridden people being herded into gas chambers before us. But the, the question we face, and I think it's one that, that, that um, that recent events have brought very much into into saliency is whether whether that's enough um, and we increasingly see that liberals um, progressives when they're confronted by people who may not necessarily agree with liberal principles or progressive principles what recourse do liberals or progressives have to convince people that actually all human beings are equal, that um, the strong, the rich do have a, a, a duty of care to, to the weak and, and, and to the poor. Basically, they, they shout Nazi. And the question has to be, what happens when people turn around and go, yeah, and? Because what we lack is the, 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 the theological seedbed, the cultural seedbed, the seedbed of that enormous inheritance of, of, of Christian belief and practice and ritual that has sustained these beliefs for 2,000 years. If they're gone, can these beliefs be sustained? That's, and that's the huge question. And that's the question that Nietzsche in particular asked. And it's one to which I don't know the answer. Unfortunately, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not a futurologist, but I think it is a question that, 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 that has to shadow us. Don't, but isn't, it, it's just, isn't that what humans do? I mean, we, we ad adopt things from the past while jettisoning parts I mean, I understand, of course, your of course your point. Without that giant mechanism, without the, the structure around us, we may go very awry. But don't we we take we borrow ideas of democracy from ancient Athens? We borrow ideas um, our morality from a uh, various source, Christian and other sources in the in the East and things. Well, like what? I mean, what 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 are the influences in the East that have have powerfully informed? Well, Western Confucian, no, no, sorry, not Western morality, but Confucianism, right? So in China, I don't think that Confucianism has had any influence on us. Oh, not us, no, but, no, but people I mean, in the East, is, people yeah, in the. But, in but China. that's what I'm saying is, is that, you see, the, the 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 Christian conviction that everyone should be Christian, that Christ says to his disciples before he goes to heaven, you know, go out and preach the gospel to every corner of the world, and Christians have 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 have, have done that, and it's been the enduring conceit of Christians that the way that they understand the world should probably be the way that all the world understands the world. Um, and so that's why, why it's this, this incredibly potent missionary force. Universe. Yes, the idea that its values sh properly should be universal. What happened over the course of the 19th century as uh, various missionaries, various, no, not missionaries, but, but the imperial powers, the British, the French, whoever, the Americans even, 
realized that they weren't going to um, convert the entire world to Christianity, and yet they wanted to uh, impose their values on people. So slavery would be the classic example. Slavery, the, the conviction that slavery is wrong, emerges from a very particular climate of radical Protestantism. It's first it's Quakers, then it's, it's, it's self-proclaimed evangelicals. And it's this very, very distinctive form of Protestantism that kind of just catches flame and ends up obliging Lord Castlereagh against his better judgment to go to the Congress of Vienna and to argue that slavery should be abolished. But the people that Castlereagh is arguing with are essentially Catholic powers, France, Portugal, Spain. So he can't couch his arguments in terms that are, you know, in the, in, in the evangelical terms. He doesn't really believe in it anyway. So he, to convince the Catholic powers, he gropes after this ancient Catholic idea of rights that, that you know, which is embedded in canon law, which, which had already been invoked by um, uh, Spanish friars in, in, in the 16th century. So it wasn't a wholly alien notion to them. And Castlereagh fuses the, the, the kind of the, the, the evangelical conviction that, that slavery is wrong with a, a, a kind of Catholic canon law assumption that, that every human being has rights and fuses it and creates essentially a framework of what we would now call um, uh, international law. Well, Tom, we covered a lot of history there. Thank you very much. What's the book called? It's called Dominion, uh, The Making of the Western Mind. Go and buy it, everybody. Thanks for coming on the pod. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.